All right, this is very exciting. I am here with one of my favorite co-hosts, Alyssa Farrah Griffin, and my absolute favorite author, John Grisham. Thank you so much for being here with us. A pleasure to be here. This is really exciting. So you're on The View today discussing your new book, Framed, Astonishing True Stories of Wrongful Convictions. Mm -hmm. Very exciting. Every time you're on the show, I'm always one book behind because mm -hmm. I save your books for uh, when I travel, and it's my favorite thing to do. So I'm going to catch up here. Well, I just catch finished. up and go back and buy the others. Absolutely. I, I buy them all. <laughs> Reread re the others, okay? I believe I've actually read every book you've written, and most of them more than one or twice. I've reread several. You're <laughs> yeah. actually, I think, the only author whose books I've reread. Thank you. Do you reread your own stuff? No, I can't stand to. <laughs> really? Um, I can't stand to read. I've tried to read the uh, audio. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I did I did one time for the shortest book I've written is a book called Bleachers about high school football. Sure. Mm -hmm. They uh, they cajoled me into to reading it for audio. It was a terrible experience. And I said, I'll never <laughs> do it again. And uh, I, I just, I, ca I cannot go back and read what I've written. Really? It's, yeah. I, I hear that from actors a lot. They can't watch themselves on yeah. screen. Is it just because you're critical of your own work or is it? Sure, sure. I mean, when I, when I pick a book at random and I'll flip a page and read a paragraph and I'll read a sentence and I'll go, ouch, you know, I wish I'd, wow. I wish I'd taken more time with that. Or, I, you know, I'll read something that's pretty good, but you, you, you're constantly criticizing what you've done. And it's a waste of time. The book's been printed. You can't change anything. Okay? <laughs> well, so. I, I have to ask, like, somebody who's had just such an incredible career and just the volume that you put out high-quality writing, I think for those of us who've never written books and especially fiction, how do you continue to come up with new content that's fresh and stories that resonate over the course of your career? Do they come to you? Do you seek them out? And how do you keep them unique from each other? Well, the, the, yes, they come to me and I seek them out. Uh, I was a lawyer for 10 years, mm -hmm. and I still am fascinated by the law, all aspects of the law. Lawyers, law firms, courts, appeals, cases, uh, trends in litigation, big firm blowups, all the stuff that, you know, crime, uh, the stuff that I enjoy reading. That's where my interest in criminal justice and criminal injustice. And, and that's such a fertile field area for material, for characters, for plots, for drama. It's just I read the headlines, mm -hmm. and and I also so, so some some stories I pursue for a long time, and I just can't ever get them. For example, I wanted to do a, a big a novel about the opioid crisis, mm -hmm. but it's just so big, and there's, there's so many players, there's so many moving parts. I just can't. I, I've never found. I've been saying that for ten years. Yeah. I can't find the story, and I, and I probably won't ever. Some 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 novels are just absolute gifts that drop in from nowhere. I read a, a, a magazine article one time called The Great Law School Scam. It was about for-profit law schools that uh, it, it did admit a lot of students who shouldn't be there. They borrow tons of money to go to school, mm -hmm. and they can't pay their loans back and can't find jobs. Mm -hmm. For-profit law schools, and it was a beautiful uh, piece of journalism, and that became a, a novel. Mm -hmm. I said, that's a book right there, yeah. and that was, that, that was instantaneous. Most ideas take a while to kind of uh, – gestate and, and come together. Uh, most of them, uh, most of the brilliant ideas I have never work eventually. <laughs> they just, they go away. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's a constant process of just always looking for what might make a very compelling story. Do you fret about deadlines at this point? Because you do, I mean, there's an expectation from your audience, I think, that there's going to be another book every fall. Well, it's the deadline's self-imposed. Um, every, usually every January, um, I'll have a discussion with, with Doubleday, and it's it's always a friendly discussion. They'll say, "What do you think?" And I'll say, "I'll, I'll have a book in October." Mm -hmm. Well, to, to to do that, I have to start each year on January the first. Mm -hmm. I start the the next book, and I'm, the goal is to finish by July the first. And I'll write about a thousand words a day, five days a week for six months. And a, the goal is about a hundred thousand words uh, per book. That's what I want to read. I, I don't want to read a five hundred page book, or especially a five hundred page. Uh, popular novel uh, and I'm getting lazier so the books are, <laughs> the books are getting shorter so uh, yeah that's kind of the process but you know so far I've, I've never hit the wall and, and I've yet to, to to sit down to write one day and not have anything to write about so far wow. so there's not writer's block is not a, a, a thing you deal with you know it's the, it's the other problem what to write next what wow. to write next yeah, no, when, when I started writing when I, when I finally pulled the trigger on the next novel, uh, I've got a very clear idea of what that book is and where it's going. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite writers is John Irving, and he sure. he said uh, he said and he still says he writes the last sentence before he writes the first sentence. 
I, I'm not quite that smart, but I do, <laughs> I, I do, I do know the last scene when I write the first scene. Okay, so. I'm writing that down because I actually am supposed to be writing a book, and I find it incredibly daunting. So I'm going to steal that advice. If you know, if you know the last scene, if you know where you're going, always that yeah. outline is crucial. It's hard to get lost. That's fascinating. So you are one of these unique authors who their the books are incredible, and they've been adapted for film and television, which has been equally incredible. Mm -hmm. um, is there any book that you've written that wasn't adapted, and you think you kind of wish had been? Well, the truth is, I have not had a book adapted in twenty years. Um, if you it's go hard back, to believe. Yeah, I know. If you go back to uh, the early nineties, when you had the firm, mm -hmm. the Pelican Brief, and the Client, all came out in the so span of similar. twelve months. Those three movies mm -hmm. had a huge impact on the career. Then uh, the uh, the Rainmaker, the Runaway Jury, a Time to Kill. Uh, those movies came out in the in the mid nineteen nineties, and uh, looking back, it was a great, it was terribly exciting time in my life and to see all these movies come out. And I thought, this is going to be easy. I can do this for the right. rest of my life. Mm -hmm. and, and and then and then they st Hollywood stopped making um, a lot of you know smart adult dramas That's and true. Uh, mm -hmm. went through a drought. Had a couple of smaller movies made, but every book I've written that has not been adapted is uh, is available for sale. <laughs> I, I would love to see all of my books adapted into really good film or television because we all enjoy watching yeah. that. Yeah. I always enjoy watching a good movie, and so I feel like your writing's almost become more cinematic in the later books in some ways. I, I, I don't know. I feel like there's a lot of opportunities there. Well, the, not by choice. I mean, that, that was not a decision I made. I, I can't tell you what's cinematic. I know I've written a couple of books I can think of that would probably not be adapted. It'd be, be too difficult. Um, and, and I'm not. I, yeah, I don't make movies. I can't. I have a hard time visualizing what could be, mm -hmm. what could be cinematic. We have right now. We have probably uh, a dozen. Uh, deals, option deals for, right. for, for TV, mainly TV, but a couple for film, trying to get stuff made. And I think we will fairly, fairly soon. There's a Rainmaker series coming out, right? Rainmaker series is filming now, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's exciting. That's yeah. one of my favorites. Just, just started yeah. filming in Ireland, yeah, a TV series. That's one of my favorites. Is there a favorite adaption for you? Is there something that you go to automatically as like, I mean, I, like uh, I love the firm, but I hate the ending. Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's something that... Uh, well, you know, I always be partial to the firm because that movie made everything happen. The book, sure. and the mm -hmm. book, and the movie. And back then, I'd I'd finish the book, and we'd sell the film rights, and the book would come out one year, and the movie the next. It's hard to believe those yeah, movies came out quickly. so fast. Mm -hmm. uh, but the the firm is always uh, has a special place around our house. Uh, the best movie I think is uh, the Rainmaker. It was yeah. Francis Ford Coppola. Yeah. Uh, who wanted he wanted me on the set every day to drink cappuccino with? He had a brand new cappuccino machine, and, and he he drank cappuccino all day long. He wanted me to sit around between takes and discuss the you know discuss the the, the story. He's a writer. It was also a very young Matt Damon, his first big movie, right. and he was uh, he was really fun to hang out with. So that was again that was almost thirty years ago. So that, that that's probably the best adaptation. But I've enjoyed. I've enjoyed all of them. The excitement of seeing them made outweighs any reservations I have about what they did. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. I'm, I would love to see everything filmed. Yeah, well, I would too. <laughs> I, would too. <laughs> I actually might steal your question because I want to ask you something similar. There have been a number of cases in the news recently, um, potentially wrongfully convicted individuals put to death or nearing the death penalty, or ones where there's just a lot of ambiguity and you even had the prosecutors testifying that they shouldn't. There was this case, um, there's this case that's been in the news in Texas of Robert Robertson, which right. I understand you testified in this case. What has draw, drawn you to getting involved in the Innocence Project and these other efforts to overturn wrongful sentences, but also just to weigh in on behalf of the wrongly accused? Well, I got involved with Innocence uh, in 2006 when I wrote a book called The Innocent Man. Mm -hmm. Not a great title, but I struggle with titles. Um, <laughs> it was uh, my first effort at nonfiction, and it took it took me. I was just fascinated by the story, and it took me into the world of wrongful convictions, and I'm still there. Uh, mm -hmm. I joined the board of the Innocence Project in New York, 17 or 18 years ago, and uh, you can't get off the board. And then I joined the board of Centurion <laughs> Ministries uh, out of Princeton, another great innocence organization, and uh, that's where my interests are. The Robertson case um, in Texas right now is is fascinating because there was no crime, mm -hmm. and he came within 90 minutes of being executed last Thursday night yeah. uh, in Texas, and a miracle saved him and and delayed his execution for at least 90 days. Uh, the committee held hearings yesterday, and I testified by Zoom, but it's just it's another one of these very unfortunate cases that um, can't seem to be stopped because 
the people in Texas, the courts and the and, and the uh, the authorities in the government uh, don't want to stop it. They want an execution. Mm-hmm. It becomes a matter of I don't know. It's almost a matter of pride to to have another execution. Mm-hmm. Now there are a lot of people in Texas who are upset about it. Yeah. Uh, there's some really strong opposition to it. A lot of there was a. <laughs> A group of uh, 84 state lawmakers, very bipartisan, mm-hmm. who who went to the prison and met with Robert and prayed with him and, and became convinced. Uh, they petitioned the governor. They petitioned the courts. Uh, there are a lot of um, people in Texas are very unhappy with this case. It'll be delayed now for 90 days, and his lawyers um, are desperate to get back into court if the courts will let them. There's brand new evidence. Uh, the child was not the victim of a shaken baby, an enraged father. The child died of uh, a severe case of pneumonia. Mm -hmm. And we have the medical experts who who are ready to testify to that if somebody will listen in Texas. And so Mm -hmm. we're... We're, you know, we're getting really creative. I'm not me. I'm not a lawyer. I'm just uh, kind of an observer. <laughs> About eight months ago, uh, one of the one of the lawyers who is very much involved in the case, a guy I know very well, asked me if I would take a look at it, with the idea of uh, writing an op-ed piece for a mm-hmm. major newspaper. And I, so I, I started studying the case and, you know, read all about it and wrote a piece and it was it was published. And I've written several other, other pieces about it now. And so I'm kind of became, uh, you know, attached to the to the story. Back then, we knew that the, the execution date was <laughs> October 17th, which was six months away. Then it was three months away. Then it was three weeks away. And the clock was ticking. And we thought, surely we can stop this uh, train wreck. Mm-hmm. And we came within 90 minutes of it last wow. Thursday. So it's a terrible case. It's just a, another case of bad science convicting innocent people. And it does feel like when there's public outcry and the public's aware of what's happening, that can help. But it often feels like it's happening too late to get that sort of national attention that these stories should have. Well, yeah, some of these cases we we don't know right now. There's not a there's not been a case of of an execution after which there was clear DNA evidence that they killed the wrong guy. Mm -hmm. That hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. In fact, I wrote I wrote a novel about that called The Confession that came out 12 years ago. Mm Um, that has not yet happened, but I've often wondered, um, and that's why I wrote the, the, the confession, what's going to happen to us as a nation, as a people, when we wake up the next morning or the next week and suddenly there's clear DNA evidence that we just killed the wrong guy? Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't mm-hmm. know if it's going to slow us down. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know. Um, the mood in the country is moving against the death penalty. Mm-hmm. There are fewer uh, death verdicts each year by juries. There are fewer ex- executions each year. Um, the death penalty is is dying a slow death, not because of uh, courageous judges or courageous lawmakers, but because of courageous jurors who are now allowed to see the full picture of what happened, where the defendant came from, most of these guys never had a chance in life. Some made, they all made horrible decisions. And, and so a little bit of sympathy creeps into the, to the deliberations and the jurors will say, okay, he's guilty. Um, he should be punished severely for what he did. It's a terrible crime. Well, let's don't kill him. Let's give him life without parole and let's spare his life. That's happening more and more. Mm-hmm. Most of what I know about the death penalty in, in that world comes from reading your books. Mm-hmm. And I've always been fascinated because I remember reading early on when I first became a fan. And I was 13 years old, I think, when I became a hardcore John Grisham fan. And I remember reading an interview you gave where you said that Jake Brigance was the alter ego of you and that very mm-hmm. much the closest you've written to being representative of you. And in A Time to Kill, he has a monologue where he's very pro-death penalty. Right. So I'm kind of curious, Did your, is that where you were when you wrote that book yes. and you evolved over time? Yes, that's where I was. That's the, that was my background. That was my uh, environment in the Deep South, a Southern Baptist sure. upbringing. And, and I think the majority of those people still support the death penalty. My, my conversion happened in a, in a heartbeat. I was on death row in Mississippi researching a book called The Chamber. Sure. And uh, I'd been to death row many times, uh, doing my research. It was fascinating. I met the guards, the inmates, the, the administrators, uh, the cooks. I met everybody on death row in Mississippi. There were 40-something men on death row. And uh, I met the executioner one day. Back then, we used the gas chamber, which was actually a, 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 a chamber. You put mm-hmm. you in and, and, and gassed. And, and one, late one afternoon, we were, I was with a chaplain 
and we were in the holding room, which is next to the death room, the chamber room. The holding room is the last place the condemned man stops to, to say, have a word with his minister or his advisor or his lawyer. And the chaplain is often the one who would spend the last moments with the condemned man, just moments before he's gassed. And uh, the chaplain was a, a retired Southern Baptist minister. And um, we were talking. It was very gloomy. It, it was cold and rainy outside. The perfect setting for a, a conversion. <laughs> and he said, uh, he said, Mr. Christian, are you a Christian? I said, I am a Christian. He said, do you think Jesus can, approves of what we do here? Hmm. There's no way to say yes. No. There's no way to say yes. Jesus didn't teach retribution. He taught forgiveness. Right. Thou shalt not kill is pretty much. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then I said, I said, no, he would not approve of this. He said, you're right. He said, this is not right what we do here. He said, killing people is not what Christians believe or most people believe. And he, and he said, if we can all agree that killing is wrong, why and how is the state allowed to kill? And at that moment, I said, you know, that makes perfect sense. Wow. And uh, that was a, the, the big conversion for me. And I've been vocal about it ever since. Right. Oh, I'm, I can't I'm, convert Jake because when I wrote that <laughs> book, he was, you know, I wrote the book in 1987. Sure. And I can't, can't go back and change that. But, uh, well, you did a sequel or two. So it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm, kind of, I'm not sure I'm going to do Jake anymore. I've done two, really? Yeah, I've done two sequels, and, and, uh, and I really like both books. But, you know, Jake's kind of grown up a little bit. And uh, I'm, I'm, I did a sequel last year to The Firm. Mm -hmm. I brought Mitch back for a book. And... Uh, I'm kind of done with sequels for a while. Oh, you are? Yeah, I'm not going to do anymore. Well, that's funny because I was going to ask, and I think I talked to your off about this the last time you were on in the green room. There is a shared universe. I mean, all of your books do take place in the same world, more or less. Maybe not the nonfiction, but Clanton exists. I mean, you're right. you're there. Occasionally, we'll hear the same director of the FBI or something right. similar. So, I mean... I want a version of this where, like, you know, Mitch runs into Darby and they're they're <laughs> floating around the Caribbean. I mean, there, there's opportunities here. Uh, it's been suggested, uh, yeah, by filmmakers. Let's let's combine some of these and make some. Sure, you, know, you got. I, I don't want to do that. Julia Roberts, Tom Cruise, and Matt Damon yeah. hanging out. Yeah, why not? <laughs> I guess you, there's no way that ever worked. But yeah, I, uh, I I got I have too many other stories to write. Mm -hmm. I think I need some fresh material. I think I'll be grateful <laughs> when you write them for sure. <laughs> it's a good problem to have. Do you? I you've probably been asked this a million times. Do you have a favorite book of all the books you've written? Uh, tough question. I mean, A Time to Kill was um, was very autobiographical, as you say. Mm -hmm. uh, when I wrote that book, I was that starving lawyer in a small mm -hmm. town in Mississippi, dreaming of the big courtroom victory, mm -hmm. you know, where I'd be the star and all that kind of stuff. And uh, that was very autobiographical. Pretty, pretty young wife having babies, and I was broke and uh, wondering what was going to happen to my career that was going nowhere. And and I, yeah, that was a lot of mm -hmm. frustration, but also a lot of uh, the culture, the religion, the people, mm -hmm. down to the food, the fashion, music, all the things you put into. That's where I'm from. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm from. And and it's it's, it's uh, I think the better books um, take place down there. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've done several stories out of Ford County. I, I I look forward to going back. I'm not sure Mitch will be involved in them. But yeah, that, that book is certainly uh, the sentimental favorite. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, uh, with at 35 years now, I can look back and and say I'm really proud of that book. I have to sure. love all of them to finish mm -hmm. them. <laughs> <laughs> just love, just love them. But you know, I can also look back and say, yeah, that was probably not a great effort. <laughs> but but I mean, I'm pretty tough on myself. But uh, I, I don't spend a lot of time doing that. Yeah, I'm too busy writing. I would imagine. <laughs> I'm always another. Uh, this is a basic author question, and I apologize because I'm sure you've been asked before. But I'm fascinated by the character names because in the books you write, you have to fill jury pools with names. Oh, you have to fill gosh. neighbors. Mm -hmm. You oh. you've repeated once or twice. I've I've noticed the last name here and there. But well, it wasn't it wasn't intentional. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's by accident. No, we we listen. Names drive you crazy. Every, every novel has two hundred names. Right, especially yours. Yeah, and you so you you. Um, I make notes. I write. I write names down. And also, <laughs> we go through this tortured process at the end of the book, where we we double check all names mm -hmm. to see if those are real people. Oh, of course. Oh, that's a good uh, and point. it's hard to come up with a truly unique name. Uh, and and now, now if if the if the character is a bad character, mm -hmm. you know, if the guy's name is Bill Smith mm -hmm. and he's a good character, you don't have to worry about it. Okay? Right. But if his name is something else and he's a terrible character, you better better change it, okay? Mm -hmm. Especially so if we, maybe you've met him once and don't remember. Yeah, or you know, <laughs> yeah. here comes a lawsuit. So right. you've, yeah. <laughs> you've always got 
these issues we have to clear up with the names at the but but I, I have fun with it because we I, I raise a lot of money for charity by selling off character names to uh to whatever the charities are Ooh. Oh, and uh we'll funny. have an auction and, and i'll sell uh you, you name a character in my next novel and uh if, if the name works and then they're, see they're given their approval oftentimes mm-hmm. it's the person who buys it who wants their name or their child or something <laughs> so they give you the approval so you, you're off the hook. Do, and, do they get to specify, is it a villain? Is it a good guy? Yeah. <laughs> no, they don't. But what I, what I tell them is uh, there, there, there's no promises. You're not a major character. You're mm-hmm. not a minor character. You're not going to be embarrassed by it. That's, you're not yeah. going to be embarrassed. It's not going to be a Klansman. Nothing bad like that. But there's, believe me, there's room for everybody in the novel right. and you have to have 200 names. Yeah, sure. I just want to be sitting in the coffee shop. Exactly. I mean, what else do you want? That's fantastic. I do want to quickly ask you about your new book, Framed, with Jim McCloskey, um, which dives into 10 true stories about wrongly convicted individuals. Was there any one thing in researching this and studying this that jumped out to you as just a jaw dropper of how the system fails people? No, there's not one thing. There are a couple of common uh, themes, um, bad police work mm-hmm. is where it starts, and, and and the police are under enormous pressure mm-hmm. to cl- to cl- get a conviction, clear the case, and move on to the next case. Uh, the the breakdown comes with your prosecutors when, uh, but oftentimes the police will hide evidence from the prosecutor, right? And so the prosecutor does, does doesn't have everything, and we we don't know this for fifteen years. It, uh, it takes a long time to to find the truth. Uh, but I'd say prosecutorial misconduct and police misconduct are, are the common themes that, that you find in every wrongful conviction case. And then you, you have the other causes like, like bad science, bad forensics, uh, improper identification procedures, mm-hmm. lying jailhouse snitches. Mm-hmm. There's a, a huge problem with ly- incentivized witnesses, incentivized informants who get paid or get time knocked off of, uh, for testifying. Uh, they're bad defense lawyering uh, judges who are just asleep at the switch, and mm-hmm. that's what frustrates me because when, when I grew up as a lawyer, you know, we had great judges, mm-hmm. and and having a fair trial was what everybody wanted, mm-hmm. and we had fair trials. And when I read um, cases now where the trials are not fair, it really bothers me. So there, there are a lot of a lot of elements that go into a, to a, a wrongful conviction. Some wrongful convictions have all of those, mm-hmm. and so they just they become overwhelming, and you think, how did this happen? So we hope we hope the book sort of explains and and uh, gives witness to how these wrongful convictions happen because we see them all the time now. Mm-hmm. Well, before we let you go, because we're the view, I have to ask: the election's two weeks away. How are you feeling? Well, you know, I agree with Sonny uh, today, what she said about women. Um, I think I think women are going to vote in record numbers. Uh, the abortion issue is going to drive a lot of votes. Uh, women, of, women of color are going to vote in big numbers. Younger women are going to vote in big numbers. And I, I'm pretty confident that, that – I don't think it's going to be that close. Everybody, really? everybody, everybody's, everybody's predicting, uh, you know, razor-thin mm-hmm. race because that's what we've become used to. Uh, but I, I just don't, I can't see America going back to Trump uh, after the last eight years of his mm. nonsense. I, I, I don't see it, and I, I never thought he'd be elected in the first place. Fair, um, <laughs> but he, he, you know he did get elected. He, he didn't win the popular vote. He never has won the popular vote. Uh, I think he'll lose the popular vote again this year. Uh, but keep in mind, four years ago there were 81 million people who voted against Trump. Yeah, That's right. Yeah, and that was a record number. Um, those people aren't going to go away. Yeah. They're going back, okay? They're going to take somebody with them. Mm-hmm. And that vote's going to be higher. And I, I don't see Trump attracting a lot of new voters this time around. So mm. I'm optimistic. All and right. you spend a lot of time in what we call real America, so that's a very interesting perspective. Yeah. 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 All right. And I'm usually wrong, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's not say, not today. <laughs> well, if, if you are wrong, I look forward to the book. Yes, exactly. About it. Uh, on that note, thank you so much for joining us. My thank pleasure. You. It's really an honor. an honor to have you here, John. Uh, the latest book is co-authored with Jim McCloskey. It's titled Framed, Astonishing True Stories of Wrongful Convictions. It's out today. I'm buying my copy. I'll be reading it on my next vacation, but I'm very excited about it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. My pleasure.